Hi everyone, I'm Kehan Parsi and I'm an associate editor for the American Journal of Bioethics and a professor of bioethics at the Neiswanger Institute for Bioethics at Loyola University of Chicago Strich School of Medicine. I wanted to welcome you all to today's AJOB webinar. The title of today's webinar is Racial Justice and the War on Drugs. We're fortunate to have an amazing panel to discuss today's topic. Both AJOB and bioethics.net are dedicated to exploring a variety of issues in the field of bioethics. Today's panel discussion will build upon the AJOB target article, Racial Justice Requires Ending the War on Drugs. The recording will be posted on AJOB's YouTube page. Now I'd like to introduce our panelists. First, we have Brian David Earp, MPhil MA, who is the Associate Director of the Yale Hastings Program in Ethics and Health Policy, and also a research fellow at the Oxford Center for Practical Ethics. Keisha Ray, PhD, an assistant professor at the Center for Humanities and Ethics at the McGovern Medical School at the University of Texas Health Science Center in Houston. Next is Jeffrey Myron, PhD, who is a senior lecturer, director of undergraduate studies, and director of graduate studies in the Department of Economics at Harvard University. And finally, Kelly Deneen, RNJD, PhD, who's an associate professor of law and professor of medical humanities at Creighton University. So welcome everyone. And the first question I'd like to pose, and this is directed to Brian, but then anyone else can join in. Um, this, I think, is a it's a landmark article for AJOP. We've never really published anything like this. Um, and so I wanted to start off with where you end the article in your conclusion. So I'm going to share with you the quote that you state here. You say, little of what we argue here is new. The ideas regarding decriminalization, at least, have been the consensus or near consensus of people who use drugs, from policy experts, harm reduction advocates, criminal justice reformers, and others for decades. So my question to you is, why has it taken so long for a group of ethicists like this to join this chorus of people who've been advocating for decriminalization for so many decades? Yeah, it's a good question. I, last night I was reflecting on, on, on this question and I, I put into Google Scholar, war on drugs and racism, and I saw what came up and there's hundreds and hundreds of articles, but they're mostly in law journals or uh, criminal justice journals or um, sociology journals. And so just to kind of test this hypothesis, I added bioethics into my search terms. And basically the only articles that came up were the target article and a job and, and the responses. It just, it hasn't been addressed within our field. So I was trying to think, well, what is going on here? And I have a hypothesis. My colleagues here, I'm sure, will be able to, to add in uh, uh, more nuance, but here's some rough ideas. One is that I think bioethics in general has a history of focusing on individuals rather than relationships or social groups, on particular uh, uh, institutions like healthcare rather than wider social systems or society more broadly. I think it also has a bias toward focusing on cutting edge technologies rather than history. And you have to understand something about history to, to, to understand the, the way in which uh, racial justice is implicated in the war on drugs. And then uh, finally, I, I, I think it has uh, an overriding concern for the, the uh, uh, white people. And so uh, the, the, the center of bioethical analysis is focused on issues that leave racial justice and the war on drugs kind of to one side. Um, so, uh, you know, th this is not to in in impugn the field of bioethics. My own work has has suffered from these biases. Um, some years ago, I was starting to write with colleagues on the potential use of psychedelic drugs as an adjunct to psychotherapies, which they're now being used more widely. And in our initial papers, we we came up with these cases, you know, imagine that a couple is under these conditions and could they use the drug and would it be permissible? And our, our colleagues and critics uh, uh, in, in those early years rightly said, maybe you can come up with a case where you can analyze the ethics of this or something like that, but what should we say about the social implications and the externalities of this kind of thing? What would be the systems level effect of thinking about uh, the introducing these, these drugs in a different way into society? So that was what first got me thinking that my, my own blinders have been on for all the time that I've been thinking about drug use and drug ethics and drug policy, that you can't really get it off the ground until you step back and, and learn more about the history, which has been something I've been trying to do in the last few years. But 
even in doing that, I see how inadequate my own education has been in this regard. So that was why it was a matter of bringing all these other collaborators together who have so much more expertise than I do in systems level thinking, history, understanding of racial dynamics and racial injustice in the US and so forth. Yeah, thanks, Brian. Uh, Keisha, I was wondering if you could add to that, because I know you were also, uh, you signed on to this article. I mean, you were part of this process. So maybe you could add a little bit of your perspective to this. Yeah, you know, um, well, first I was, you know, thank you for Brian for even approaching me, because I thought that this is definitely something that uh, we've been saying that is missing from bioethics. And that's really a going beyond just identifying vulnerable populations and, you know, the sort of criteria, you know, bioethics is really good at that saying, okay, this is what makes someone a vulnerable population. But when it comes to really studying uh, populations, especially um, people of color and uh, social, you know, the the social pressure, social inadequacies, uh, lack of resources, what contribute to those, how our policies, how our institutions contribute to making populations vulnerable, right? Bioethics has really struggled with that and really struggled with, like Brian said, really struggled with topics that are not about centering whiteness. And I think here in this paper and with this topic, you really have to grapple with what whiteness is, the impact of whiteness, and then how that has manifested itself. And one of those pathways of whiteness has manifested is the war on drugs and it being racialized and the criminalization of of, um, drug use and drug possession and, you know, uh, disproportionate incarceration rates, right? This long history of war of drugs is really about America grappling with the idea of whiteness and bioethics itself hasn't grappled with that. There are a couple of writings out there. You yourself have have written some Kehan about bioethics coming to terms with whiteness. And I think this article is really a part of this this trend that I hope to see an uptake in and bioethics is really trying to say, okay, we're going to go beyond just identifying vulnerable populations, but we're going to talk about how we got there, what we did to contribute to these populations being in such conditions. And now how do we take this bioethics framework that we're all so uh, well-versed in and use it to call attention to these issues and to better um, these situations by creating policy, influencing policies. Um, That's really what has to change. Kelly, go ahead. Yeah, so yes, everything Keisha said, obviously a hundred times. and Brian. Uh, the other thing I would just point out is another place that bioethics has been centered in many ways for a long time is in medicine, right? And uh, people who use drugs and people who have substance use disorder um, or are perceived to have substance use disorder, such as people with chronic pain who benefit from opioids, um, have been marginalized and made invisible, both because of um, our, these longstanding individual and institutional bias and discrimination, but also because of structural discrimination, where we have literally told medicine for a hundred years that taking care of people with addiction is not the legitimate practice of medicine, right? And um, where we, you know, just within the last several years do we have fellowships in addiction medicine, and we still have inordinately high barriers for doctors who want to take care of patients with substance use disorder because they are subjecting themselves to additional surveillance, right? Additional hoops and additional scrutiny and stigma, right? So it's no surprise to me that bioethics has ignored this problem especially at the intersection of race and disability with addiction, right? Um, uh, Because medicine has largely ignored this problem, right? So I think that's also another compounding factor. Maybe just to add a quick point to this, because I think you're totally right. Part of the medical lens is often to individualize problems because it's easier to study things at the level of the individual. Partly there's just an epistemic problem here, which is if you want to try to understand how a whole system works, you have to have many interdisciplinary research projects going on and looking at something from multiple angles, where if you want to say, what are the effects of drugs on this person and how can we use some medicalized individualistic intervention to try to to treat their problem? Well, that's going to just follow out of how medicine works. And since bioethics, as Kelly's rightly saying, has been predominantly concerned with medicine as an institution, it has inherited some of the individualizing uh, explanation for 
seeming social problems um, rather than than looking at at the structural uh, uh, um, considerations at, at a wider social lens. Um, before we want, Jeffrey, did you have anything else to add to this? So I'm not an ethicist, so I can't really comment. That's on okay. That's okay. <laughs> but I'm an economist, but I will comment just briefly on the relationship between an economics perspective on prohibition and the history of racism involved in the drug war, which is that the natural economic framework wouldn't immediately talk about race. It would talk about the fact that if you outlaw a substance, you drive the market underground, that leads to all sorts of bad things from crime and corruption and poor quality control and so on. So I started studying this topic about 30 years ago, and I was interested in the history as well as in the economics. And I noticed fairly early on that there was this amazing correlation, this, this awful correlation between the institution of prohibition laws and an attitude, an attempt to suppress a particular minority group. And it goes way far back in the 1830s and 40s, the Northeastern US states were getting substantial migration from Ireland and the Irish were thought of as heavy drinkers. And so native Protestants in those states, they passed these anti-drinking laws perhaps because they didn't like the Irish, perhaps because they were trying to suppress labor market competition from the Irish immigrants. Can't easily figure out which is which of those two it is, but had, this, had the same effect of trying to suppress the Irish. Then similar things happened during other immigration waves. When the Chinese immigrants were coming to the U.S. in the 1880s and 1890s, there were laws against smoking in an opium den they aimed at that particular group of immigrants. Similar things with Mexicans and marijuana, similar things with African-Americans and alcohol prohibition and drug prohibition around the turn of the century uh, and so on and so forth. So that pattern of initiating these laws in part, not just because of racism, but at least in significant part, consistently because of racism, that became obvious as one of the crucial negative consequences of prohibition. Yeah, I'm so glad that you put this into historical context. This is not something that just happened overnight. It's not even as long as the history of the war on drugs, although that's been around for some time. I mean, so it's, it's deeply rooted in American history. And I thought, I think you highlighted the number of groups that have been targeted. Um, you know, I'm very interested in language and metaphors. And the metaphor of the war on drugs has been a very powerful one. Um, it's persisted for many years, for many decades. It's shaped our public policy and just public perceptions about people who use drugs. And it, in my estimation, uh, it's really a war on poor people who use drugs. And I was wondering if, if you all could kind of talk a little bit more about the metaphor of the war on drugs and how, how it's really impacted the way we, we view this issue of, of drug use in this country. I'm not an ethicist who focuses on the ethics of war, but I have some colleagues who do. And one thing about war is that it, it, it plays by different rules. You know, you suspend some of the normal ethical parameters and guidelines that would play out in, in peacetime. So, for example, you create enemies and the enemies are people that you can kill. And in order to kill people, you have to dehumanize them. And so I think when you when you put this in terms of a, a war rather than say, you know, some, any number of more positive metaphors you could try to, to use to shape your social policy, you create black and white thinking, you create enemies, you foster dehumanization, and you say, well, they had it coming. You know, if they hadn't been on the wrong side, if they hadn't been, you know, we're the good guys and they're the bad guys, then, it, you know, it, this this wouldn't uh, affect them. And so you you're, you have your, your reasoning totally backwards because you should be trying to help and lift up people who are disadvantaged, not, uh, you know, uh, mischaracterizing this and how the enemy and which which gives you the license then to treat them uh, unjustly. Yeah, and I think similarly, you know, this is something that I'm a bioethicist, but also a philosopher by training. And so sometimes we talk about the the othering problem, right? The they problem. And I think with the war on drugs, it was really it's been really centered around this is that community's problem. This is, you know, not not our issue. We are somehow better than this, or this isn't, uh, especially if you make it into racialized language, right? This isn't a white America problem. This is a, a Black America, a Chinese America, a Hispanic or Latinx American problem. Um, it really makes it easier to say, when you can make it a they problem, you can also make it a, a morality issue, right? You can say things like, 
um, they are participating in immoral behavior and all the bad things that go with it, whether that's, you know, loss of housing, loss of job, loss of family, then they deserve it. Right. It makes you feel less empathy for them if you can say their actions caused this result. And therefore, I don't have to help you with things like social resources. I don't have to help you with job or substance abuse therapy or, you know, anything to help you have the social resources that and physical resources that you need for prosperity and well-being because you can sort of blame people. Right. You got what's coming to you. You participated in drug use. Now you deserve all the bad things. And that comes from this they, which this war of on drugs language sort of separates the us and the them, sort of like what, what Brian was saying. Of course, the war yeah. on language goes beyond just drugs. Politicians like that metaphor more broadly because it sort of obscures a lot of details. It allows you to, as Brian said, have villains. We had a war on inflation. We had a war on poverty. We had a war on crime war on drugs. And all of those are illogical because you can't literally fight a war against inanimate substances or an inflation rate or anything like that. But it's useful for politicians to whip up support by creating that sort of imagery. Right. And I mean, we love the false binaries, right? And that all fosters the dehumanization. Um, the other thing, though, I would say is I would say, at least since the Controlled Substance Act of 1970, it's, you know, a war on Black people and other people viewed as, you know, uh, worthy of subrogation, right, who use drugs. We have a former Nixon policy, domestic policy advisor saying explicitly, we couldn't make it illegal to be Black or to be a hippie, right? And so instead, we, uh, we associated hippies with marijuana, heroin with Black people, and criminalized them both heavily that way we could disrupt their communities, right? So um, it, it's explicit, like, and it's doing what it was intended to do, um, but it's certainly not a good outcome. The other kind of language we see, especially lately, since the focus kind of shifted to opioids, right? And that became uh, sort of the heuristic for everything wrong with the world, um, is the language of infectious disease used a lot, right? We've got the epidemic language, but we also, when you dig into the medical literature about preventing diversion and stuff, there's a lot of language about universal precautions and other things borrowed from the infectious disease world, right? Uh, so language is, you know, really one of the factors, one of the things that's explicitly used to further segregate people, right? Um, and there's lots of studies even on the way we refer to people with substance use disorder. And so if we call them people who abuse substances, uh, prosecutors endorse punishment more readily and um, healthcare providers endorse less caregiving and more like, well, let the, let the cops deal with it, right? So there's a whole lot there to unpack. I wish I... Uh, truly studied rhetoric, not just as like sort of a side hobby, but it, it's really um, interesting, but you, you know, does what it was designed to do. Yeah, it didn't happen by accident. No. Yeah. Um, so, you know, we've talked about the, the war metaphor and how it's used for nefarious purposes. Um, in the Target article, uh, Brian had stated that we really need to do more than just kind of tinkering on the edges we need to really have um, radical kind of whole cloth change. And, and you use the term, uh, which is another metaphor, uh, a Marshall Plan, you know, some kind of post-war Marshall Plan to really um, move away from this dominant regime of addressing drugs and drug use. So can you speak a little bit more to that? And I, I'd like to hear other people's thoughts about that. Let's see. Sure. Um, yeah, a couple of thoughts of, uh, about that. So one is that um, I was consulting with uh, Carl Hart at the beginning of mapping out this article and trying to figure out what's our vision for this piece. And I remember we had a phone call where I initially was talking about well, something about decriminalization. And I'm not sure if we should get into the debate about legalization or how far we want to we want to take this. And uh, be between Carl and me, one or the other of us came up with the, uh, the the letter from the Birmingham jail and the notion of the kind of white moderates who want to just take things slow and let things unfold as they do. 
and uh, and I, I said, well, I don't I don't want to be the representation of white moderatism in this in this crucial moment. So let's just take this as far as we can. And and that was Carl's, uh, um, you know, s- strong um, advocacy for that for that position. So that's kind of what what we went with. But I think what some people think is if you move away from prohibition. And let's say that you have some sort of legally regulated system where you have tax revenue that could be redirected towards social services and away from criminalization, that that their their assumption is that that uh, influx of money could could be enough to sort of so- solve the problem. Well, 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 we'll sort of even everything out by by reinvesting the money. And that's that's not enough. And so one of our co-authors, Eric, and I remember, can't remember his last name, uh, made this point um, that uh, it's unrealistic to think that you're just going to redirect some some funds and some some tax money, and you're actually going to deal with the, the deeper structural roots of this problem. That requires, um, you know, a, a full scale commitment to really um, shift shift the shift the the whole basis uh, beyond what you can do with just tinkering. And so that was something that we wanted to emphasize at the end of the article. There. Any other thoughts about that? So I would have a slightly different perspective, which is that to me, what's crucial is, first of all, to fully embrace the legalization, that all of the halfway houses still retain substantial restrictions, still maintain underground markets, still create quality control problems, still have the racist implications and all those things. I think you have to fully legalize it and treat it at most no more strictly than we treat alcohol and tobacco. and even there, there there's some restrictions that are probably excessive. Um, As to whether there should be substantial spending on social problems or such that are perceived as related to drug use, I think that's a separate question to which we don't know the answer. We partially don't know the answer because we don't know to what extent the people who seem to be in a bad way and to be using drugs are in a bad way, mainly because of prohibition, because they have to spend excessive amounts to purchase, they have to buy from criminals, they get poor quality or unknown quality, and so on. So I think the decisions about redistribution, about um, treatment programs and all those things are things that ideally we can think about again once we have a legal regime, because we don't quite know what the right approach is to those things. I just want to quickly yeah. give credit. It's Eric Eric Sterling is uh, the co-author who proposed the Marshall Plan language, and I just wanted to make sure that I, I gave credit where credit's due. Yeah, I think the only thing I would add is, well, how how many how many months do you have? I could add a lot, but the only thing I would add is, yes, I think we have to blow it all up and start over again. Um, but it's worth remembering that even if we uh, get rid of all of these harm inducing laws and policies, right? And put in policies that theoretically are not so harm inducing, right? Um, We still have to deal with this through like a racial and disability equity lens here, right? Because those laws are going to be enforced by people who have lived in this system of these mutually reinforcing, right? Individual, institutional, and structural uh, discrimination. Um, so that's really important to keep in mind, but I think, you know, the thing is for people who aren't steeped in this to really understand, and I'm happy to answer questions offline is most people who are chronically ill or dead from drug use have died because of loss, right? Because they're dead from fentanyl-laced drugs that they took from unreliable and regulated sources, right? They're dead because we criminalize even programs like syringe services programs, right? And we're trying to roll back the ones that have been effective. And so people end up with HIV, hepatitis, and other um, chronic conditions that affect their lives. Um, and, you know, we, we have, we all of us, the health system, the legal system, we all have blood on our hands on this. Uh, People are dying unnecessarily. And, um, you know, it's not okay. Yeah, I I think too, I think we talk a lot about changing policies and what we're going to do going forward. But we also can't forget the effects of the laws that we that are already in place, right? We have 
for instance, if you take just the black community in general, there's a long history of the effects from the war on drugs, even if it even if all drugs were decriminalized tomorrow in the cross the states. Right. We have destruction of black families. We have black children in foster homes taken away from families due to substance abuse issues, incarceration rates, uh, economic inequality. Uh, not having access to substance abuse therapy, right? So there's this long list of the things that we still have in the Black community from the war on drugs that a policy change just by decriminalizing drugs is not going to fix, right? There still has to be some concerted effort to talk about, to address those fixes, and I mean, to address those effects. So to think about, you know, I've been thinking about this in my work lately, like what does racial justice mean going forward when you have to also reconcile the past? You have to reconcile um, the Black health, the health of the community, health of Black individuals, right? And think about just general, how do we talk about reparations? How do we talk about amends going forward? How do we repair this damage? Because policies that decriminalize drugs are just not going to deal with the, the historical context. I want to raise one more question with you all, and then we'll shift to questions from our attendees. So this was a... Um, a point made by a couple of commentators to the main target article, this is by Calkins and Reuter, and they make the following statement. They say, prescription opioids amply demonstrate the limits of regulation and controlling harms. POs are regulated more tightly than our most consumer products, and by a health promoting agency, the uh, FDA. Nonetheless, PO contributes directly or indirectly the majority of drug-related deaths that do not pertain to alcohol or tobacco, two other legal regulated drugs, so that's their quote. Um, they argue for, quote, a modestly enforced prohibition of production and sale generates most of the benefits with few of the adverse consequences. What are your thoughts about that? That um, they seem to have some problems with, um, you know, basically completely decriminalizing and, and regulating and that they point to other, you know, so for instance, opioids as contributing to greater deaths. And so what, what are your thoughts? I'm going to jump in first here because I just I just want to make sure we correct that statement about prescription opioids because it was stated without any attribution or citation um, and it's incorrect. Even at the height of um, you know the height of where we still had very high levels of prescribing and high levels of um, deaths from overdose, um, seventy five or roughly seventy five percent, depending on the year of the deaths were from poly substance contribution. Also, the CDC has uh, not, um, and they're working on this now to correct it, but for years, they counted fentanyl, illicitly, illicitly manufactured fentanyl in the death rates with people on prescription sources of fentanyl, okay? That's problematic because we don't know what the source of the harm is, right? But yet, despite those facts that were evident even before the big policy pushes, the decision was made to focus on prescription opioids alone, um, which has not worked out so well, right? Back in 2015, 16, when I was saying this is a bad idea, we need to look at this more holistically, you can't just target that, uh, people would yell at me at conferences. I've never had that experience and it's gotten better, but people would stand up and scream at me that I was killing people. But here's the truth. Now that people have studied this, things like PDMPs, which we all rush to is like, that's the best thing since sliced bread. Um, in states with very strong PDMPs, it's likely the overdose rate went up. Why? Because we didn't address this holistically. So practitioners are just like turning people away. You know, you didn't pass the PDMP test. And there's at least one study that showed that doctors were more likely to have a uh, staff person in the office tell a patient they were discharged from the practice after something strange came up on the PDMP than to actually go in and have a conversation with them about, hey, you may have a substance use disorder. I care about you. I'm not going to abandon you. You know, let's talk about options, right? Um, so, so we know that that sort of opioid uh, prescription opioid myopia, um, myopia, sorry, myopia hasn't worked, right? It didn't work. Also, we know the um, number of prescription opioids has gone down by, I think it's, oh, it's close to 40%, 30 something point, like 8%. Um, 
since 2013. Guess what? The deaths haven't gone down. It's just they've just more have been attributed to um, first heroin, now illicitly manufactured fentanyl, right? The the deaths involving um, uh, methamphetamines and other stimulants have gone up exponentially, right? So we have a poly substance crisis, right? We don't have an opioid crisis, right? It's multiple crises, right? Um, tied up together. Also, I, you know, I don't need to say it again, but prohibition doesn't work. So the idea that we're going to endorse more prohibition, it makes absolutely no logical sense to me. And the third thing I would say is um, that we've got another casualty on the war on drugs after the sort of focus on the opioid um, epidemic in, in out of context, really. And that is people who have chronic pain and had been functional for years on opioids and found themselves rapidly tapered or discontinued without an adequate care plan, many of whom were dying and continue to die um, by suicide because their functional ability was just thrown out the window. So you've got doctors and systems just saying, we don't prescribe opioids, right? And this intersects powerfully with race. So you've got, you know, sickle cell disease is not a black disease, but it does affect a lot of black and brown folks, right? Because it's based on your um, ethnicity to um, of the equator, right? So we've got lots of black and brown folks with sickle cell disease who aren't getting taken care of, who aren't getting the evidence-based care, which is treatment with opioids when they're in crisis at a minimum, right? Who are suffering greatly. So we've got to step back and recalibrate our approach to this. Um, that opioids are sometimes helpful, sometimes harmful, right? And we have to look at these things in context, in the context of both the system and at the patient level, or we're never going to reduce the harms associated with them. Any follow-up to Kelly before we move on to our questions? I'll just agree. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. Well, uh, there's a few questions here that I wanted to get to. Um, so I, let me let me start off with this um, question that it actually relates to what Kelly mentioned. So Dr. Deneen helpfully mentioned the current opioid crisis. Several historians and other social uh, social scientists, most recently Sam Roberts at Columbia Mailman, have pointed out that contemporary opioid abuse and addiction have been framed differently than the crack cocaine use and addiction at the heart of the quote unquote war on drugs, resulting in markedly different legal, public policy and medical responses. Do you agree? And if so, what role might bioethics and bioethicists play in addressing and highlighting lessons within this discrepancy? Any thoughts? Go ahead, Kelly. Go for Sorry, it. I don't want to monopoli monopolize things. <laughs> no, go, ahead, so, no. go ahead. I mean, lots of thoughts. Yes, of course, right? And as soon as as soon as uh, the the more recent opioid epidemic uh, was, you know, framed in the narrative of the nice young white kids, right, or the nice uh, unsuspecting, you know, white patient who was given medicine by their dentist or their doctor, right? suddenly we had some empathy, right? And then the racism got piled on top of, like people were saying, oh, well, you know, black people are lucky because they were undertreated, you know, for pain. So that was protective. No, no, they weren't lucky. They were discriminated against, right? That was racism, right? And then if they do have um, substance use disorder, they're, they suffer more again, right? Because you know, at the time that everybody was worried about these nice young white folks with opioid use disorder, they were ignoring long-term um, people who had a heroin use disorder or injected drugs. Um, in many areas, those folks were predominantly black for a lot of the reasons we've talked about before. The white folks were just able to obtain the medications or the, the substances that um, helped fuel their disorder right from doctors, right? And, uh, you know, well, I'll stop there. But yes, it's totally racist, right? And, and 
we need to, bioethicists need to call it out, name it. And also we need to work really hard on questioning, questioning um, our presumptions. Um, you know, even at the clinical ethicist level, if you hear about a problematic patient, why don't you ask why they're problematic? Like I not too long ago asked to do a commentary on a person who had checked out AMA um, five times with uh, infections related to injecting drugs. And nobody asked, why do they want to check out? I mean, the, 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 the target arg- article in that case was advocating a sort of substance use disorder advanced directive where people agree now to have their contemporary, contemporaneous ejections later ignored. Um, and I'm just saying that wouldn't happen with a population that wasn't seriously marginalized. And nowhere in the article did they look at the facts that people who were admitted with injection drug um, complications um, are mistreated terribly by staff. They're surveilled and tracked. Um, They are often, more often than not, only about 20% of the time do they have their serious withdrawal and pain treated. So they're miserable in withdrawal and treated badly, I think it's perfectly rational to sign out AMA, right? But so we need to start thinking about these things instead of instead of centering it as a problematic person. No, it's the system and we need to respond as such. Yeah, I'll just add that I think this is another example of why it's also really important for bioethicists to have media training, to teach our grad students how to do media training and to participate in and popular journalism and sources and to know how to talk to journalism. Because I think a lot of how the opioid crisis and uh, crises, right, and um, war on drugs and crack cocaine ep- epidemics, right, how they were, how we talk about them was framed a lot by the media. And I think if bioethics who, and they, it also gets formed by just a few sensationalized stories, right? And then they become the, the center of the narrative, of how we talk about these two different drugs. And I think if bioethics who know the data, who know how to talk about these things, who can frame these things, if they are talking to journalists and that becomes part of the popular news sources that um, everyday people are, are using to get their information about these drugs, I really think that bioethicists can have a very real impact on how drugs get framed, how drug users get framed, and how um, substance abuse therapy gets framed. But I think a lot of times bioethics, we don't engage with, with popular sources enough. And I really think we need to. But also, we're, we're not taught how to do that. We're not trained how to do that. We sort of just figure it out and, and make some errors, try the errors here. And maybe we talk to a colleague who's made some mistakes and we learn from them. But I think it has to be much more formal. We have to prepare our grad students and our postdocs to be a part of this, uh, a part of media. Yeah, no, I agree with you, Keisha. I think uh, ethicists especially need better training on how to communicate with um, members of the media. You're absolutely right. The vast majority of people consume their information through mass media sources. They're not looking at scholarly articles in the American Journal of Bioethics. And so I think it's incumbent upon us to be able to connect with the broader audience in a, in a clear and effective way. So I, I definitely agree with you there. Um, so back to some of the questions that have been posted here. Um, one, one question here was, um, and I'm trying to understand if this is the right way to ask, but why should the people, why should people of color be once prone to use drugs resulting in injustice in law enforcement? And I guess the question is, why is it that people of color who use drugs are the ones disproportionately targeted by law enforcement. And I think this came out in the Target article, Brian, maybe we could talk a little bit more about that. Well, just one point that we stress is that if you look at the base rates of drug use across pretty much every drug category, there are a few exceptions. White people seem to use psychedelics a little bit more than black people and black people seem to use, I think, maybe marijuana slightly more than than, uh, white people. But in any event, across pretty much every drug category, rates of use are quite similar. Actually, I'll just say one of my motivations for writing this article is I spend a lot of time on college campuses and you're around young people who may use drugs for personal purposes. And uh, among my white, yeah, it happens, it happens. You know, in, in, in conversing with, you know, uh, my white friends, the, the the thing that was very clear was that anybody who used drugs just didn't even occur to them that they could be surveilled or that it might be a risk for them or that they might get in trouble. 
in any kind of a way. And, and when I'm then looking into the literature and seeing these unjust enforcement tactics, that, that struck me personally as just that that's not right. They, 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 there's whole classes of people who it doesn't even enter their consciousness that perhaps this could be something that might have personal consequences for them. And then you have entire communities that are that are unjustly targeted for at, you know, traffic stops that are these investigatory traffic stops. You know, those are not e- evenly distributed among racial groups. Um, and so that was that was part of the motivation for writing this article that just seemed like a fundamental unfairness, given that the base rate use of drugs across racial groups is pretty comparable. Um, another question here. Um, this person says, questions raised here are incredibly relevant. For example, back in Ukraine, as a neurologist, I was involved with issues of marijuana usage. Um, as a Muslim Crime, uh, Crimean Tartar who would use it for recreational purposes instead of alcohol, which is prohibited by Islam. Most of the allowed recreational substances are modeled by the usage by white Christian majority, but should any substances be allowed to one group and prohibited by others? It's an interesting question. So this is more of uh, not maybe the state sanctioning certain use, but certain groups, certain faith traditions may sanction certain kinds of substances and not others. Any thoughts? Uh, well, I mean, we already have that little bit um, <clears throat> anyway, right? But um, informally, right? You don't. Uh, uh, the, the rich white folks who are using cocaine every day don't um, very often find themselves in trouble for it. So we have sort of an informal thing. Um, and then, um, uh, you know, the Supreme Court uh, said that, it, you know, like the, I, I, I should have looked at these this case earlier because I can't think of it now, exactly the name of it, but it was about peyote use by Native Americans, right? And they said that that wasn't, protected and then you got the religious freedom restoration act in in response right that's been used in different um and um controversial ways in different settings but um i think that just as a matter of policy at least in the united states it makes more sense to let you know if you're going to redesign something at least part of that would be legalization and quality control and then all the millions of things we don't have time to talk about but to let that be sorted out on an individual or social group level, right? Rather than through a state, you know, state or federal or local action, I would think, but I'm open to many other viewpoints. You know, one one thing that I found interesting over the last several years, and, and perhaps this is a paradox, but what we've seen over many years is the growing destigma or growing stigmatization of tobacco use. So now tobacco use aligns with people's education levels and income. So for instance, if you go to an academic conference, you're gonna see very few people smoking tobacco or using tobacco for that matter. But now we're seeing um, legalizing of drugs, recreational marijuana is now legal in many states. I live in Illinois, there's a dispensary just down the street from me. Um, are we going to see this kind of strange paradox where legal substances such as tobacco become increasingly more stigmatized, even though it's a legal substance, and substances that were formerly illegal becoming destigmatized and being more normalized? Is that something that you think we're going to see over the next several years? I think so. And I think it's partially because many people's view of legalization versus prohibition comes from thinking about the potential danger of the substance. And so things that they think of as dangerous, they tend to think should be restricted or prohibited. And things that they think are relatively benign, they feel the opposite way. And over time, more and more people have come to accept that marijuana seems to be mainly benign. Of course, you could misuse marijuana in certain circumstances, but all things considered, one of the more benign substances around, whereas tobacco is based on, you know, decades and decades of evidence is very, very bad for you. And so the same people who are making impassioned pleas for legalizing marijuana, many of them would be perfectly happy, I think, to outlaw tobacco. Whereas if you would take the economist perspective, which is the most of the negatives come from the policy and the unintended consequences, unwanted consequences of the policy, then whatever you outlaw, if it's something that a lot of people would like to buy and sell, you're going to create the underground markets and get all the negative consequences. So we will 
in this view, end up seeing drive-by shootings over cartons of cigarettes. We will see cart uh, tobacco cartels working out of Mexico or wherever. Uh, we will get all the same negatives of prohibition if we go too far down the anti-tobacco road. I think, too, to, to answer your question, uh, Kehan, is I think there will continue to be a sort of a detangling or separating from legality and morality. I think that's really a, was a large part of war on drugs is uh, seeing people as immoral drug users. Right. Um, and I think the more that we separate that, the more that things will drugs will be start to be seen as a little bit more acceptable. Uh, those drugs that weren't in the past. I think just to add to this, uh, one thing that we can tell based on the comments that have just been made is that um, currently it's not the case that there's a one-to-one -one mapping between the drugs that are more harmful and the drugs that are illegal. You know, illegality and harmfulness come apart. And as Keisha's saying, illegality and immorality can also come apart and may do so increasingly. Um, but uh, th there's also the, the question of, in terms of harm, what is the likely harm under prohibition versus under an alternative regime? And I think people often fail to make that comparison. So um, uh, to, to tie into the, the media presentation of these ideas, I saw that there was some newspaper that ran an article about the, the age of target article, and they got a comment from a representative of the, the, the police in England. And the police representative said something like, well, why should drugs be prohibited? Just look at how harmful they are this, that, and the other, you know, crime and all this other stuff. And, and it's like saying that because drugs have certain harmful effects under prohibition, therefore they should be prohibited is non sequitur and it's kind of circular. You have to ask yourself, what would be the relative harms under a more permissive regime with regulation rather than prohibition? And people can't seem to make that jump. They go, well, drugs have harms, therefore prohibition. And it's like, that doesn't follow. You have to ask what's more harmful, drugs under prohibition or drugs under alternative regimes. And getting people to make that distinction, I think it will be really important. And it's not, it's not intuitive. Yeah. If you go back to the, like, to the early 1900s, um, there, were, there was not the crime related to drug use, right? Before we like really created federal restriction and surveillance, right? Criminal enterprise grew from that. So it's not just like a recent phenomenon. And every time we've uh, consolidated, you know, and then in 1970, we consolidated a lot of disparate federal laws and agencies and put them together. And if you look at the uh, Senate testimony and other other um, things around the discussions of those bills, it's very clear, like the crime just continued to go up. Um, so it's not just something people say, like the crime is a response to the prohibition, right? Um, yeah. So along these lines of legalizing, for instance, marijuana, one question asks, might the experience of states which have legalized marijuana provide support for a broader legalization of addictive drugs, or is this experience simply too limited and fragmented to be helpful at this point? There's one potential lesson or caution from the legalization of marijuana, which uh, some, one of some of the commentators raised, which is that there's been a bit of a capture by big, big, well, big pharma, big drugs, I don't know. <laughs> some of the things happening now with proposals to legalize, like in Oregon, uh, psychedelic mm. uh, medicines for so-called personal mm. use. So you have, you know, a big sweeping in uh, of uh, commercial interests. And so, so a, a, a legitimate concern is, you know, if you're going to have legal regulation, you have to ask how robust is that regulatory regime and how much of it just gets captured by commercial interests who then have an influence on regulations that are friendly to their um, to their uh, bottom line, which is to have more drug users. And so that's a real concern. And I think that we should be looking at the potential uh, negative consequences of certain kinds of regulatory regimes so that if this model is to be expanded and to include other types of drugs, as is already happening with psychedelics now, at least in Oregon, um, it, it, we should learn the lessons of some of these uh, early legalization experiments and try to head off some of the, 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 the negative um, aspects, which, which includes this commercial capture. So I would wholeheartedly uh, second the view that we have to be careful about regulation, but I think it's relatively simple. The more regulation, the more you're going to keep small sellers out of the market because they're fixed costs of being in the market, the more you're going to tend to leave the remaining market to major suppliers. Not that there's anything wrong with having 
a few dominant suppliers and lots of smaller suppliers. We have two or three companies that make most of the beer, but we have micro brews sort of all over the country in every city of any size. But the regulation that's been put in place in the marijuana legalizations has done lots of harm. It's restricted the number of outlets that can sell legalized marijuana, so people have to travel excessive distance. It's caused the prices to be higher than they otherwise would be. In some cases, it's kept the black market alive because the legalized regime was so restrictive that it actually didn't make that much sense for people to bother with going to the legalized recreational or medicinal stores because they could still grow it in their backyard or buy it from some kid behind the high school just as easily as they could from driving 50 miles away or only being able to purchase an ounce at a time and other crazy stuff like that. So I think the less regulation, the better off the outcomes are going to be across from all the possible indicators. One thing, one thing that's very interesting about this is just how counterintuitive that is to, I mean, I don't have training in economics. I've got my background totally different. So when you say this, I, I go, oh, that kind of makes sense. But it, does, it doesn't seem intuitive. And I think it doesn't seem intuitive to policymakers. It doesn't seem intuitive to voters necessarily. Similar to how we think, well, the drugs that are legal are probably the more harmful ones, or the people who are using drugs are probably bad people. I mean, we have these, these ready-made intuitions about how we should navigate the space. And it turns out that the better rational policy is often not the one that makes intuitive sense until you start to see how some of these things are connected. So I think a major component of this discussion is basically a public education and also policymaker education uh, uh, aspect. Um, you know, building on what Keisha was saying earlier is that it's not enough to just say a few things here and there. You have to put it in a framework whereby the counterintuitive um, processes that, that have to be put in place for this to be successful become more intuitive to people. But you said very succinctly, one of the things that economists point out over and over again, which is that regulation, even if well intended, ends up getting captured by the people who are in the industry and the big suppliers like more regulation because it keeps out the small competitors. And so one should, in economics, we come with a sort of a healthy suspicion of regulation rather than the intuition that regulation is going to be beneficial. We see it as often being manipulated by some of the players for their own self-interest. Yeah, I mean, people who make the laws and write the regulations are humans too, right? So uh, beyond just this sort of more nefarious lobbying and intentional sort of capture, you also have humans. And when it comes to drugs, right, we're all so indoctrinated in, in biased and incorrect information. Uh, I think it's going to take more than education. It, it's going to take like some real debiasing, right? We're all polluted by decades of um, intervention, the TV show, which is just full of incredibly harm-inducing approaches to substance use, right? Um, tough love, right? No, just love. Tough love is a myth, um, and it ends up killing people. I could go on, but I won't. <laughs> so just a couple more questions before we wrap up. Um, someone said, thank you for this important dis discussion. Given how slowly law changes, might the panelists have suggestions on how hospitals and other healthcare entities could revise their institutional policies to decrease stigma and provide better care for patients who may test positive in the ER when arriving to deliver their baby or elsewhere? Well, first of all, I want to know why are they being tested in the ER to deliver their baby? A, what are you doing with that information, right? Um, you know, if, if somebody doesn't have a good answer, for, the, for why they need that information and why they can't get that information from a patient through a relationship. I know people, I mean, hey, I wouldn't want to tell either. When, when admitting to a disorder means you are a criminal, right? And also, uh, so we need to question all our presumptions in healthcare. What are you doing with that information? If you don't have an addiction, an inpatient, a good addiction medicine consult service, and a way, for example, if it's opioids, to start medication for opioid use disorder, you don't need that information. The ends of medicine and healthcare is to the well-being of the patient. Uh, that's not going to get you there if you don't have a treatment plan, right? And it's going to destroy any even fragile trust that patient might have, right? Also, are you making presumptions? Let's use the baby example. Are you making presumptions about somebody's ability to parent? right? Using a rule of thumb, a shortcut of drugs in their system, right? No, we need to be looking at actual evidence, right? It's not a shortcut. People who use drugs parent their children just fine, right? 
people who don't use drugs often are abusive to their children, right? We need to stop just using these, you know, sort of type one thinking about everything and then going from there. Um, And uh, hey, substance use disorder is a medical condition, right? Why don't we treat it like one? Because people in healthcare don't believe it yet. I mean, that's, it's as simple as that. So just keep reminding everybody, it's a medical condition with very effective treatments. But even for people with, very severe opioid use disorder, only about 20% of them in the best estimates receive appropriate treatment. And those are among the people that want treatment. It's inexcusable. We wouldn't, we would not make that okay for heart disease, diabetes, anything, but we're perfectly fine bringing somebody in during an overdose, giving them Narcan stabilizing them and sending them out into the community in withdrawal. And they'll be lucky if they get a slip of paper that tells them where they might find treatment, right? And uh, the pain of withdrawal from opioids has been described to by many past users as like a terrible thirst after a long hike in the desert. Um, So we're sending them out without any love, without any support, without any resources and expecting that they're not going to use. It's rational for them to use under that circumstance and they're more likely to overdose. So we need to be accountable for this. This is a healthcare problem that needs to be addressed even before, you know, I'd say even before we get to the legalization or in tandem, um, there's a lot accounting, there's a lot of accounting to do and a lot of resp- self-reflection that needs to be made by um, healthcare providers in this space. I, I would add too, um, I like to okay, start it off with why are we doing it? I would also, uh, my initial reaction was who are we testing, right? Because it's always the same people. It's yeah. poor people, it's people of color, it's people who look like they might be a, a substance abuse user, right? It's always based on these assumptions, oftentimes classes and races. Um, and sometimes, you know, other phobias come in, uh, homophobia, transphobia, right? And we think that these people must be drug users. Now let's test them. And so I think who we test, how we test this question, uh, given by Lori Bruce, I think it's a part of a bigger, just a bigger races and classes problem in healthcare in general, right? How do we address racism and classism in healthcare? Who has access to healthcare? Who is, uh, has access to good quality healthcare, right? And not, not just the healthcare, but the actual people who listen to them while they're there seeking care, the people who properly treat them and who think that they are deserving of care and deserving of empathy and deserving um, to have a healthy outcome. And so I think it's, it's, it's just sort of another, just another sort of branch from the tree of racism and <laughs> classism that we have. And so addressing those problems, however we do that, whether that's education, whether that's policy, whether that's training, um, I think once we do that, these other sort of branches will, will also start to be better. Yeah. And I, the other thing I would just add too that, you know, on top of all of our individual implicit bias, sometimes it's explicit bias, mm-hmm. right? Um, you know, I think in some of the behavioral uh, economics literature would tell us that visceral biases, like a patient who presents us, presents in a way that makes us angry or indignant, especially indignant if perhaps the, they've used something we've prescribed, right? will drive really bad decisions, including decisions that really hurt patients. Um, and if we don't do a better job of really examining decision-making mm-hmm. in healthcare, I think that um, it's particularly salient in, in these cases. Absolutely. Well, uh, we are out of time. <laughs> the hour flew by. Um, I wanted to thank all of our panelists today uh, Brian Earp, Keisha Ray, Kelly Deneen, Jeffrey Myron for your participation today for a very rich and robust discussion about today's topic, uh, racial uh, injustice and the war on drugs. Uh, attendees, if you haven't had a chance, please uh, read the Target article. It's actually freely available um, on our website, so check it out. And the recording of today's session will be made available on AJOB's YouTube page. So once again, thank you all for your participation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.